Man, this game isn't running so good. I should probably go into the settings and change some stuff. Whoa, what the heck, man? You have to be a freaking scientist to understand this stuff. Well, though, all you need is a helpful video that explains what these settings are and how to tweak them to get your games running good and looking great. Um, okay, but who are you and how did you get into my house? Oh, I'm Techweeb and I'm here because I'm dating your mom. What? Hello, hi there, I'm TechDweeb, welcome, thanks for clicking on the video today. If you play games on a PC, whether it's a gaming PC or a mini PC or a handheld PC like the Steam Deck, you've probably had to dip into the graphical settings to make some tweaks to get the game running better or looking better, and you, you probably noticed that lots of these options are not really explained good. Well, don't worry, buddy. Your old friend TechDweeb is here to clarify and demystify and unconfusingify all these graphical settings for you, and I don't even need to date your mom to do it. I'm going to tell you which ones make a big difference, which ones don't, and not only that, but I'm going to explain what they are in a way that even you could understand. Uh, probably. The test subject of our settings tweaking and twerking today is going to be Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I like this game for graphical testing for a few reasons. Uh, one is that it has just the right amount of settings, with all the important stuff. Uh, two, when you change the settings, they are applied instantly in the game, so you can easily keep an eye on the performance while you tweak and twerk around. And three, I get to hang out with Laura Croft, who's my girlfriend, who loves me. So I think I'm ready, and you're obviously ready, and Laura's ready. Ready, so let's dive in. Wee! Oh God, Laura, no! Before we get into the individual settings, I just want to point out that many games come with built-in settings presets, and you can use these to get uh, different levels of graphical fidelity and performance without having to mess around with the actual settings. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we have five presets. Highest, high, medium, low, and lowest. And I also made a video comparing the different settings presets in various games. Check that out, link below, if you want to know more about that. Starting off with what is arguably the most important setting in any PC game, the resolution, which is the pixel dimension that the game renders at. More pixels means more detail. Your monitor or your TV has a native resolution and higher resolutions are more demanding to render because that's just more pixels that the game engine needs to generate. So if you want to get better performance in a game, one very effective way to do that is just to run the game at a lower resolution. So here in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, I could run at 19 20 by 1080 or I could go down to like 1600 by 900 or if I wanted way more performance I could go down to 1280 by 720. However, the game will appear blurrier, including the text in the game and the menus and the interface, so generally you want your resolution to be as high as you can get it while still getting the level of performance that you want. And also I need to mention that uh, lots of the resolutions are made for different screen ratios. So 1920 by 1080 is made for 16 by 9 widescreen displays like mine here. But if I go down to 1280 by 1024, that resolution is for 4 by 3 displays, so it'll feel stretched if you're using a widescreen display. And then we have resolution scale. And this is different than changing the resolution because for the most part, resolution scale only affects the actual game graphics, not the interface and menus and stuff. So you can lower the resolution scale down to like 50% and you'll get a lot more performance and the game graphics will look like the game is being run at a lower resolution. However, the, the HUD elements and the menus and the text, that'll all be running at a, the native higher resolution of your monitor. I made a video entirely about resolution scale. Uh, check that out, link below if you want to know more. And not every game has this option though, so if it's not in your, in your settings, then changing the resolution is probably going to be your only option. Also on the topic of resolution, we need to now talk about upscaling. Upscaling is actually a bit of a misnomer. It, it's actually downscaling the resolution. So the game will render the game at a lower resolution. And th then the upscaler uses some AI computer magic to make it look like it's a higher resolution image. There are different types of upscaling and some require specific hardware. For example, DLSS requires an NVIDIA RTX graphics card. But some of them, like AMD's FSR, which isn't available in Tomb Raider, but it is available in lots of games that support upscaling, that could run on any hardware, more or less. 
Here's an example of one scene being run at uh, the four different DLSS quality settings. As you can see, most of them look pretty good, but we do lose detail as we gain performance. And at the lowest fidelity, you uh, get some upscaling weirdness, even though you gain a ton of performance. So it's a trade-off. VSync is a very important setting to understand. It's like this. Your monitor has a certain refresh rate, which is how many frames per second it will dis display. The game has its own rate of how many frames per second it's running at. If the game generates more or less frames per second that your monitor is set to run at, then you'll get what's called screen tearing, which is where you get only a portion of the new image that's generated because the frame rate of the game doesn't exactly match the refresh rate of your monitor. So VSync makes it so that only complete frames are shown. You won't get screen tearing. The vast majority of the time you want the setting enabled because screen tearing sucks and it looks terrible. However, there are some situations like if you're benchmarking or if you have an adaptive refresh rate display that you'll want to leave it disabled. Speaking of refresh rates, some games give you the option to choose what the maximum refresh rate or FPS that the game will run at. There's not usually a need to go down low in this value unless you find that you're getting stutters at higher values, or if you want to limit the resources needed to save battery life or generate less heat, which is why I only manually set my refresh rate on my devices like the Steam Deck for instance. Anti-aliasing is a fundamental setting. You'll find this in almost any game because it's so important. When your PC renders an object in the game, for example, the, the power lines here, it has to do it out of pixels. The problem is that the edges of the lines, especially diagonal lines, they end up getting all jagged because, well, th well they're made out of tiny little pixels. So what anti-aliasing does is it softens the edge by adding extra semi-transparent pixels. There are several different types of anti-aliasing, and I'm not going to be able to go super in-depth about each of them because I could make an entire freaking video about anti-aliasing. But the short version is that FXAA, or Fast Approximate Anti-Aliasing, is the least demanding, but it doesn't have the highest quality. TAA is Temporal Anti-Aliasing, which means that it collects samples from multiple frames, and it looks really good. And it doesn't have a huge impact on your FPS, depending on which GPU you have. And MSAA, or SMAA are the most demanding and they don't usually look better than TAA. You should try out each one that's available in your game and see which one looks good while not impacting the performance too much. Texture quality. This determines how high of a resolution the textures used in the game are. So look at this wall in Tomb Raider. At low, it's very blurry. And then as we move up to ultra, we get more and more detail. The thing about uh, texture resolution is that it doesn't have a big impact on performance as long as you have enough VRAM on your GPU or your integrated graphics. For this, I suggest going with medium textures and trying the game. And if it runs well, then increase the textures and play for a bit, get those textures as high as you can go without letting your performance dip because this is one setting that has a huge impact on the visuals of your game. So you want to get it as high as you can. Texture filtering, or which is sometimes called anisotropic filtering or sometimes just texture filtering. The idea behind this is that as textures move farther away in the distance, especially on angled surfaces, your game doesn't need to use super high res versions of the textures because you don't see much of the texture. So the idea here is that as the textures move away, they can be swapped out with lower resolution or blurrier versions of the textures. Can you see on this river bank how the areas of dirt closer to the camera are very detailed but as it moves off in the distance they get kind of blurry and muddy that's texture filtering and as far as options go usually we have bilinear or trilinear filtering which are basic versions of this and they don't have a very good range and then you can have different levels of anisotropic filtering which just means that you have um, more stages of transitions for the texture quality and it smooths out the effect so you don't notice it this is a very lightweight effect. It has almost no performance impact. It, it has a pretty big visual impact. So in most situations, you'll just want to crank this up to the max, to be honest. 
Rendering shadows takes a lot of graphical horsepower to do, and adjusting the shadow quality is a big way that we can uh, get extra performance. I find lots of games look really good with medium shadows and you get way better performance compared to high or ultra. So this is one you'll want to experiment with and see how things look and, and perform at different settings. And I should mention that some games look like total garbage when you completely turn the shadows off. Uh, Tomb Raider is one of them. But if you're trying to get games running on very low end systems, turning the shadows right off, that might make them playable for you. Ray tracing, it's a big topic. There are lots of uh, effects that involve ray tracing, and I'm not going to be able to go over all of them in this video. The short version is that you need a, a graphics card with ray tracing hardware, like an, an NVIDIA RTX GPU or an AMD Radeon 6000 series or better. And it's a very demanding setting, so be prepared to take a huge performance hit. In some games, the visual impact isn't that much. For example, in Tomb Raider, the ray traced shadows don't look any better than the non ray traced shadows. So in this game, it's not worth bothering with. However, in some games, it can be a, a huge visual difference. And if you have the hardware to use it, then you might as well, as long as you still get the performance that you want. I, I've made a, a few videos about ray tracing. I'll link to those below if you want to know more. Ambient occlusion. It, it's a very interesting effect. It, it's basically a fake way of giving objects a shadow effect without needing to actually render shadows. You might be familiar with giving objects drop shadows in, in Photoshop or whatever. That's sort of what's going on here. Ambient occlusion usually has a few different modes that you could choose from. Screen space ambient occlusion, or SSAO, is done with the object's proximity to the camera and each other. So things that are close to each other can cast drop shadows on each other. It's a pretty lightweight effect and it looks okay, but it's not super realistic. HBAO is horizon-based ambient occlusion and it handles it a little different. It's based on the depth of objects relative to each other, so it doesn't rely on the screen space at all. The, the occlusion is independent of the camera, so to speak. HBAO is the best looking uh, occlusion in non-ray traced scenarios. HBAO plus, I, I should say. It's the same thing, but with more samples. So it's much smoother. It's a pretty good looking effect. It just makes the scene feel a little bit more real. However, keep in mind that if you turn it off, you can get some decent performance gains. Depth of field basically applies a camera focus effect. So things that are very close to the camera get out of focus, just like a real camera. You can, you can see it here on Laura in this tree. These areas that are super close to the camera are blurry. With depth of field off, you can see that the whole scene is in focus, including the very close stuff. Some games use this effect more than others, and depending on the game, it could have a big impact, so disable it if you're trying to squeeze out performance. Level of detail, it's, it's an ambiguous setting. Every, every game handles this differently. Usually, it's just about swapping in some of the assets for lower detail versions. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, that means that the game will change a few of the objects in the distance to be low poly versions of those objects. Some games, it's a big difference, and some games like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, it's barely different at all. So you'll want to at least try this setting in your game and, and see how much of a difference it makes. Tessellation is a big one. It's, a, it's big in terms of performance, but it's also big in terms of visuals. Here's how it works. Game textures are usually flat. They are a picture of a texture that are applied to a flat surface, and there's no actual ge geometry in the texture. However, tessellation is a trick to bring depth to flat things. It, it works like this. Uh, any texture can have a, a second a texture that determines the depth and then the game will use that second texture to extrude and give depth to the base texture. This is how we get these realistic chunky bumps in the dirt here, or how the other objects look like they have more geometry than the non-tessellated version. This is a very demanding setting though, so if you're trying to gain performance, definitely turn this one off as one of your first steps. It does look really good though, so keep it on if you can. Bloom is a simple idea. You, you know when you take a, a picture or a video and there's something bright in the image and it has this sort of glow around it? That, that's Bloom. It makes the game feel like the bright things are more bright and the performance impact is very low, so leave this on unless you don't like it for some reason. Motion blur is when the game engine gives a directional blur to objects that are in motion, including the entire scene when you move the camera. It's a divisive topic. Some people hate it, lots of people hate it. I, I rarely hear people saying they like it. 
I guess I'm a weirdo then, uh, in lots of ways, as I'm sure you've noticed, but here too, because I love motion blur. Lots of people only think it's beneficial at lower frame rates, but I, I like it no matter what. I think it adds a, a cinematic look, especially during the action heavy scenes. It can be pretty intensive uh, depending on the game though, so turning this off is a good idea if you need extra FPS. Screen space reflections. So the, the old way of doing reflections is that the game would take a pre-rendered full 3D picture of the, the room or the area and use that as the basis of the reflection on the surface of water or windows or whatever. This is good because it feels like a real reflection and it's very lightweight to, to render. However, it's not good because if you're looking closely, you can see that the reflection doesn't actually line up with the object. It kind of floats around on the surface. Screen space reflections are real reflections. The actual objects that are rendered that you see in the, in this, in the scene are also rendered in the reflection. Uh, much more realistic, but also very demanding because the game has to render two versions of lots of the things in the scene. And unless you're actually looking closely at the reflections, you probably won't notice a difference when you're actually gaming. So only enable screen space reflections if you have the hardware to push it without tanking your performance. Volumetric lighting is where shining light sources can illuminate the, the air itself, like, like as if the air is misty or hazy. This is great for giving um, depth to scenes or even just like a certain mood. You, you can see it here, these shafts of light that they're, they're making the air glow as if the air is thick and humid. But when we disable the effect, it feels like there's not any weight to the air. It, it feels crystal clear and we lose those shafts and the feeling of a, a thick haze. In my experience, this isn't very intensive in most games, but I've seen some games that tie this in with global illumination and and it can be demanding there, so it's worth toggling on and off to see what the difference is. Lens flares are when very bright lights have an extra glow around them and sometimes an extra shine, which mimics the effect that you get if uh, the scene was filmed with, with a camera lens. This is a very lightweight effect, so turn it on if you like it, or turn it off if you don't. Lens flares are a type of screen effect, but there are other screen effects too. Uh, these are things that add a, a layer onto the screen itself, usually for effects like rain spattering or splashes or even like burning effects. You can sort of see it here as Laura splashes around in the mud like the dirty girl she is. The screen effects make it look like the camera that's filming this is getting like splashy. I, I usually leave this on, but in some games the effects are pretty dumb looking, so just turn it off uh, on a game by game basis if it ends up bothering you. And that's basically the basics. That's basically the basics. These are probably the most common settings that you'll come across. And now you have all the info in your brain that you need to decide which ones to mess with and which ones to prioritize to get Laura Croft looking great. Eh, just kidding, Laura. You always look great. Hey, do you want to uh, get together and do something this weekend? Oh. And that brings us to the end. I hope you found this useful. Uh, let me know if there's any settings that I didn't cover. Thanks as always to my generous patrons who help make what I do better. If you'd like to become a patron and support the uh, things that I do, there's a link in the description below. And that's it for me. I'm TechDweeb. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.